I'm so happy to be here, and um, it's going to be my pleasure to introduce uh, Marina McGlore, uh, who is an assistant professor of English at the University of Miami. She holds a PhD in English uh, from Duke University. Um, so welcome back, Marina. <laughs> and her research on black feminism and diasporic religions uh, has been supported by the American Council of Learned Societies, um, U.S. Department of State, and the Hutchins Center for African and African American Research at Harvard. Her current book project, uh, We Pursue Our Magic, Voodoo Feminism from the Harlem Re Renaissance to Black Girl Magic, explores the influence of Afro-Caribbean spirituality on black American women, uh, women writers and performers. Moving from the Caribbean ethnograph ethnographies uh, of Zora Neale Hurston um, and Catherine Dunham to the resurgence of woody ima ima uh, imagery in texts of Audre Lorde and Lucille Clifton, this work um, and her work or argues that contrary to popular beliefs about the solely liberatory function of African diaspora religions, Af uh, Afro-Caribbean spirituality has taught black American fem feminists to confront the inescapability um, of alienation, inauthenticity, and privilege. Marina's work on the subject has been published or forthcoming in Small Acts, African American Review, Meridians, uh, and, and Pelimpflest, and, and she's also working on a second book project on Afro-surrealism. Um, and, and, and so, um, and the title of her uh, talk today, The Only Black Girl in Anthropology, Spirituality, Travel, and the Making of the Transnational Black Feminism. So please welcome Reina. All right. Thank you so much for the introduction. Thank you so much to Ranjana Khanna, Jasmine Cobb, and Sarah Rogers, who actually used to be my roommate um, when I lived in Durham. It's really nice to be back um, in, it's really nice to be back in this space with like a little more power and leverage, <laughs> to be honest. Um, <laughs> just being real about that. Um, so uh, a few notes before I start. Um, so this research is actually research that, I've in, that I'm including in my ongoing book manuscript. So I'm definitely happy to talk about how it fits into my larger project. Um, if you want to read more specifically about Catherine Dunham, who I'll be talking about today, I actually published an article just on her Haitian ethnography in Small Acts called An Ethics of Discomfort, Catherine Dunham's Voodoo Belonging. So if you want to read that um, for more specific information on her practice, um, please do. And I um, also wanted to note my um, overlap with um, Dr. Chancy's talk from yesterday um, in that we are we both discuss um, Zorniel Hurston's engagements with Haiti, um, but I'm hoping that this will be a productive complement to Dr. Chancy's talk yesterday and um, I think really speaks to the importance of Zorniel Hurston as a transnational feminist figure. I think she definitely merits two talks <laughs> um, for sure. Um, so without further ado, um, oh, I also wanted to dedicate this talk to my beloved ancestors, Catherine Dunham and Zora Neale Hurston, of course, um, and also to Audre Lorde, who is the glue, I think, <laughs> um, of this talk, as you'll see. Um, I also wanted us to meditate on a kind of epigraph that I have to this talk um, that's um, from the Audre Lorde poem, Between Ourselves. Um, and it just reads, I do not believe our wants have made all our lives holy. I'm going to repeat it. I do not believe our wants have made all our lives holy, which I think really speaks to some of the strategic essentialisms that we were talking about in, the, um, in um, our previous conversation. So um, the only black girl, the only little black girl in anthropology, spirituality, travel, and the pursuit of transnational feminism. It is telling that Zora Neale Hurston's barbed maxim used to this day, my skin folks, but not my kin folks, was written during the time of her fieldwork in Haiti. 
Every part of Hurston's Haitian fieldwork was plagued with difficulty, including her grant application process, during which she butted heads with another Black woman in anthropology, Catherine Dunham. When they first crossed paths in the 1930s, Dunham was a glamorous Midwesterner who would later be known for her popularizations of Afro-diasporic dance forms in an American performance in cinema, while Hurston was a charming Southerner and student of anthropology who would come to be known as one of the greatest literary stylists of African-American letters. Perhaps it is inevitable that the competing authenticities of these two women would clash. As African-American women conducting pioneering ethnographic research in Jamaica and Haiti in the 1930s, their fieldwork overlapped, overlapping both thematically and temporally to such extent that Hurston accused Dunham of stealing her research itinerary. There was even some suspicion on Hurston's part that the, the Rosenwald Foundation, which reneged on a portion of her fellowship offer for her research and graduate education in 1935, simply used the intended funds for Dunham's research instead. And Dunham did indeed travel to the Caribbean with a Rosenwald Fellowship that year. So transferring from one black woman to another, which probably not a wrong analysis. Um, in 1936, when Hurston finally received funding from the Guggenheim Foundation to conduct her Caribbean research, she wrote to Henry Allen Moe, the secretary general of the foundation, that Miss Catherine, misspelled Dunham, was a petty dancer of Chicago and that she stayed here in Haiti six months with infinitely less preparation than I have for the work. In a 2000 interview, an elderly Dunham is able to, re to regard their rivalry with a sense of humor. While she acknowledges that in the 1930s, she was jealous that Hurston, quote, didn't care a thing about me, and quote, she knew the other, the anth the other anthropologists better than I did, she also acknowledges the pettiness of that competition um, by saying that, I don't know who told me that I was going to be the only little black girl in anthropology. But Dunham's and Hurston's desires for exceptionalism was not intrinsic to their relationship. It was ingrained in American interwar conceptions of the fledgling identity category of Black women anthropologists. In this economy of authenticity, the Caribbean became not just a space for spiritual and intellectual discovery for the two women, as they had hoped, but a place on which their ethnographic authority and thus their careers and livelihoods depended. The financial patronage system for Black artists in the interwar period made these two brilliant women into competitors rather than collaborators. Their rivalry was exacerbated by the pressure to be the first to be the first participant ethnographic observer of hitherto undocumented Afro-diasporic rituals at a time when, for white anthropologists, in the words of Halifa Oshimare, merely being there with a pad and pencil was deemed enough participation. Both women were considered were the, prot the protégés of two of the leading white anthropologists of the day, Zora Neale Hurston as Franz Boaz's student at Barnard and Catherine Dunham as a mentee of Melville Herskovitz. Boaz, in his preface to Hurston's 1935 ethnography, Mules and Men, assures the reader that Hurston entered, that Hurston, quote, entered into the homely life of the Southern Negro as one of them and was fully accepted as such by the companions of her childhood. Thus, she has been able to penetrate through that affected demeanor by which the Negro excludes the white observer from effectively, uh, from effectively participating in his true inner life, end quote. Historian Kate Ramsey notes that Herskovitz had similar feelings about Dunham's ability to participate in Afro-diasporic ritual, where a white anthropologist could only ever be an outside observer. But the idea that a Black American anthropologist is welcomed unequivocally into the fold of a foreign community of Black people elides the struggle, work, and inevitable failures of diasporic community building. Despite the radical potentiality of the participant observer's gaze, early Black women anthropologists like Dunham and Hurston struggled to establish the necessary bonds of trust and understanding between themselves and their estranged diasporic kin at their fieldwork sites. Both Hurston and Dunham experienced a great deal of discomfort during their Haitian fieldwork, from gastric disturbances to scoldings from their informants. If they were supposed to be greeted with open arms by their, skin, their, by their skin folk abroad, how could this be possible when they did not even consider themselves to be kin folk at home? The case of the, this case of, rival, of rivalry between Black American women who ostensibly shared similar goals and circumstances is only magnified on a transnational scale, with both women struggling to establish ties with Caribbean women in their fieldwork sites. But what if we considered the unconsummated friendship of Zora Neale Hurston and Catherine Dunham as indicative of, in the words of Audre Lorde, quote, 
all of the endless ways in which we rob ourselves of ourselves and each other, end quote. That is to say that the tantalizing possibility of their friendship was not an interpersonal dynamic, but a structural one inherent to that tenuous we that is black women. These, stru- these fractures are not exceptions to diasporic like blackness. They are constitutive of it. And the failures of connection between women of the diaspora are by no means have by no means been resolved by new ethnographic methods or by an increased sensitivity to global power dynamics, as today's anthropolo- black anthropologists have noted. As Lyndon K. Gill, conducting fieldwork in Tobago in the early 2000s, notes on black American desires for transnational connection, quote, this individualistic idealism is most naive and most American, but subtle in its seduction of even those most skeptical of American exceptionalism. These are the hard revelations that bring the disillusioned among us cheek to cheek with the disturbing imprint of the United States upon us, specifically when we've managed to leave it behind. It can never be left behind, end quote. Similarly, in her ethnography of African-American women's tourism in Jamaica, Bianca C. Williams argues that although black American women's tourism, quote, serves as strategies for critiquing and responding to the ageist, racist, and sexist discourses that marginalize them within the United States, um, ultimately, Jamaicans they interacted with often reminded them that while they all, may all be black, American blackness was drastically different and made the travelers more privileged, end quote. The past century of Black anthropology shows a history of Black Americans coming to the painful realization that people from across the diaspora do not have a simple relationship to one another, and to imply that they do, even if it is for liberatory purposes, is to engage in the very oversimplifications by which white supremacists have denied us our humanity for centuries. Black women, too, can be hapless tourists. Black women, too, can inconvenience local people, be sloppy, sleep with their informants, hold troubling political beliefs, tear each other down, as both Hurston and Dunham did during the course of their Haitian fieldwork. I'm not going to get into all the instances in which they did that, but happy to answer that in the Q&A. <laughs> I mean... Okay, I mean, Dunham, like, really goes into a lot of detail about, like, sleeping with the future president of Haiti, for example, um, who is one of her <laughs> informants. Um, uh, um, as as Dr. Chelsea talked about yesterday, um, Hurston is, like, kind of considered to be an apologist in a lot of ways for the um, for the American occupation of Haiti. Um, like, Dr. Chelsea also troubled that, um, that distinction, but I think there are some, like, very troubling statements that she makes. Um, that I don't think can be ignored either. Um, so anyway, um, there is some utility in examining Hurston and Dunham ste- Hurston's and Dunham's steps side by side. Their parallel experiences as they unknowingly crossed and uncrossed the ghosts of one another's paths, paths in Haiti can be seen as a cartography of our own desires, of who we have been and where we are heading. I am taking Audre Lorde's imperative in her essay, Eye to Eye. Quote, Often we give lip service to the idea of mutual support and connection between black women because we have not yet crossed the barriers to these possibilities. And to acknowledge our dreams is to sometimes acknowledge the distance between those dreams and our present situation. End quote. This is an exercise in dispelling the lip service in order to measure the distance we have yet to go in forging equitable connections between black women, both across and within national affiliations. Hurston and Dunham, as I have said, both struggled to establish ties with their Haitian informants in the wake of the American occupation of Haiti, which ended only two years before their arrival in 1936. The hagiographic image that has adhered to Zora Neale Hurston in the wake of Alice Walker's 1975 essay is quite at odds with the Zora we see in Hurston's 1938 ethnography, Tell My Horse, Voodoo and Life in Haiti and Jamaica. Hot and disgruntled, suffering from indigestion, listening to ceremonies in a language she had not fully mastered, Hurston's sojourn in Haiti is not, as her mentor, Franz Boas, had hoped, a portrait of a native informant. It is the portrait of a Black American tourist rubbed raw by the vicissitudes of a global Blackness thought to be monolithic. In contrast to her sympathetic account of New Orleans hoodoo in her 1935 ethnography, Mules and Men, Hurston's account of Haitian voodoo in Tell My Horse is famously riddled with contradictions and inaccuracies. 
In the eyes of an anti-racist readership, she is uncomfortably pro-U.S. occupation of Haiti, enamored of authoritarian male male leaders of the Haitian Revolution, and generally supercilious toward Haitian people, for whom, in her words, quote, freedom from slavery only looked like a big watermelon cutting and fish fry to the irresponsible blacks, those people who have no memory of yesterday and no suspicion of tomorrow, end quote. When Hurston returned to the U.S. in 1937 after a year of fieldwork and a debilitating, quote, violent gastric disturbance, her circumstances and career path did not lead to a long-term relationship with Haiti. Contrastingly, the fact that Catherine Dunham wrote a more nuanced um, portrayal of Haiti in her 1969 ethnographic memoir, Island Possessed, is made possible by a decades-long relationship with the country, in which the initial disgust, anger, and discomfort of her 1930s fieldwork gave way to an attempt to understand and rationalize transnational disparities between diasporic people. The difference that time creates between these two accounts is a true testament to the required work of diasporic kinship and its status as a dream deferred. Despite notable differences between the texts they produce from their fieldwork, both texts are plagued by fears surrounding the voodoo practice of spirit possession and the separate but oft mythologized practices of zombification. Hurston narrativizes one of the first documented cases of zombification, of putative zombification in Western anthropology, in her encounter with a Haitian woman called Felicia Félix Mentor. Hurston meets Félix Mentor in a hospital in Gonaïve in 1936. She is a battered woman with, quote, dead eyes, and she, quote, showed every sign of fear and expectation of abuse and violence, end quote. She is unable to speak. The attending doctor tells Hurston that Félix Monteur died and was officially buried in 1907, only to reappear in her hometown 29 years later, naked, alone, and robbed of her mental faculties. Hurston attributes zombification not to an awakening of the dead, but to a drug, quote, some secret probably brought from Africa and handed down from generation to generation that destroys the part of the brain which governs free will and action. Zombies are thereby used as beasts of burden by their masters, a transformation from human to beast that Hurston describes thus, and um, quotes, think of the fiendishness of the thing. It is not good for a person who has lived all his life surrounded by a degree of fastidious culture, loved to his last breath by family and friends, to, compl- to contemplate the probability of his resurrected body being dragged from the vault, the best that love and means could provide, and set to toiling ceaselessly in the banana fields, working like a beast, unclothed like a beast, and like a brute crouching in some foul den in the few hours allowed for rest and food." from an educated, intelligent being to an unthinking, unknowing beast, end quote. The slippage between human and beast is pervasive across her, across her sense of, shared between her reflections on gendered power dynamics, possession, and zombification. The title of Tell My Horse comes from the language of possession in Haitian voodoo, which refers to people who are possessed as the horses of the spirit. The title, the title of Mules and Men, her ethnography detailing, among other things, a spiritual economy in which black women use magical practices to right structural imbalances, can also be seen as a commentary on the interpersonal disparities between women and men if we consider her description of black women as the mules of the world in their eyes were watching God. So translation of mules and men, the title might be women and men. Both titles highlight Hurston's discomfort with women's bodies robbed of agency, of bodies made bestial by cruel usage. Hurston, in other words, applies the powerful metaphor of zombification, already implying conditions of enslavement and compromised agency, as an analytic of gender. Her obvious horror upon meeting Félix Monteur, she says, the sight of this wreckage was too much to endure for long, is due in large part to the fact that this is a woman who can no longer speak and who cannot even narrate the damage that has been done to her. Dunham also lingers on a description of female zombification in Island Possessed. When she visits the home of a man called Ticuzin, who is rumored to live with a number of women he has transformed into zombies, Dunham is morbidly fascinated with the validity of these claims. As both Dunham and Hurston note, the Haitian zombie is a beast of burden, an insensible and unprotesting slave to the person who made them. When the zombies become wives and constitute a kind of harem, the intersection between forced labor and sexual violence becomes pronounced. In the presence of Ticuzin, 
a man whose unique combination of condescension and charisma leaves Dunham uncharacteristically flustered, she wonders, quote, if this was the beginning of being zombieized. Robbed of her usual articulacy, Dunham's fear of zombification is a recognition of her own vulnerability to the assaults um, on her personhood that black women across the diaspora must face, positioned as they are under the twin yokes of patriarchy and colonial and racial violence. However, Dunham does not choose the route of martyred identification or solidarity with the zombie wives, silent women who, quote, with faces with absolutely no expression and which might as well have been the faces of the blind or deaf, end quote. Rather, she feels herself at once compelled by their plight and impotent to stop it, positioned as a, as a quote, lone woman with others behind her in spectral attendance. Dunham's anxiety comes from the tension between the privilege that safeguards her from the fate of zombie wifehood and a sense of responsibility to Haitian women who do not have the, tr have the freedom to travel as she does, to speak as she can, and thus stand in silent witness to her doings. Dunham strikes a, strikes a delicate balance between acknowledgement of the privilege of her position and feelings of kinship with Haitian women without, try, without falling into paternalistic imperatives to save Haitian women. Lamenting the woes of her adoptive country without ever presuming to be proportionately affected by them, Dunham admits upon one of her return trips to Haiti during the Duvalier regime, quote, they live here all year round. I, for my part, felt f sad and sick at the increased poverty, distressed at the lost melody of a wide-eyed scholar. Here, Dunham's longing for a diasporic community dissolves into despair as the material realities that keep diasporic communities mired in difference and, and contradiction come to the fore. These mutual fears of zombiehood, in other words, are Hurston's and Dunham's acknowledgement of the fragility of their own autonomy and, and their own mobility, and their solidarity with all the black women who never had the opportunity to be anthropologists. Their fears showcase the fickleness of their fugitivity and the all too keen awareness of the possibility that their pedestals on which they have been temporarily elevated above other diasporic women might be snatched from underneath them, as indeed they were. Their divergent paths illustrate that very fragility. It may seem that Dunham's long and storied career as a dancer, teacher, and choreographer counters Hurston's famously impoverished and obscure death, ending in an unmarked grave. However, Hurston's illustrious afterlife as a genius of the American South, as Alice Walker calls her, and Catherine Dunham's more modest legacy, in which she has been left out of mainstream conceptions of Black history, calls into question the permanence of their earthly success. Due to the precarity of her success, it is unsurprising that concerns about women's loss of agency are a constant theme throughout Hurston's work. Through her use of the trope of the beast of burden, Hurston defines possession throughout her work as a social process, as a symptom of structural violence. In Their Eyes Were Watching God, for instance, she represents black laborers in Florida as physical husks prone to possession by lesser beings, um, meaning their white employers. Quote, mules and other brutes occupied their skins. It is not until the end of the workday that, quote, the skins felt powerful and human. I argue that this problematic in Their Eyes Were Watching God, which was famously written over the course of seven weeks during Hurston's time in Haiti, was crucially informed and framed by her Haitian fieldwork. When encountered with religious and supernatural forms of displaced agency, Hurston inevitably thinks of them as violent forms of social control, as social relations that mirror and reproduce the relationship between master and slave. Hurston views servitude as a crisis of consciousness, and as a result, Hurston views two vastly different phenomena— spirit possession, and zombification under the same rubric of suspicion. However, contrary to Hurston's fears, this process of zombification is actually quite the opposite of the phenomenon of spirit possession. In Vodou, when a person is ridden by the spirit, the person's guobonange, the part of the soul that governs agency and which is in fact stolen during the process of zombification, is temporarily displaced to make room for the spirit. Quite the contrary to Hollywood depictions of mindless enjoyment and voodoo ritual, this can be a terrifying prospect for the person possessed, even when they are familiar with the ritual. For Black American women, like Dunham and Hurston in particular, grasping at ethnographic authority in a field that viewed Black women as ethnographic raw material rather than as theorists in themselves, the loss of this hard-won self-possession was a bitter prospect. 
And this is in sharp contrast to their contemporary Maya Deren, a white anthropologist who embraced possession less ambivalently. This explains why many of both, of both Dunham's and Hurston's description of spirit possession are profoundly ambivalent, especially when possession and queerness collided in a spectacle of social control. Both women were publicly heterosexual, yet dogged by rumors of their purported queerness, and both used their time in Haiti to think through the dangers of queer visibility. Both their ethnographies discuss almost the exact same anecdote, in which a young butch lesbian is brutally punished by the spirit Gede. In Hurston's account, it reads, quote, A woman known to be a lesbian was mounted one afternoon. The spirit announced through her mouth, Tell my horse that I have told this woman repeatedly to stop making love to women. It is a vile thing, and I object to it. Tell my horse that this woman promised me twice that she would never do such a thing again, but each time she has broken her word to me as soon as she could find a woman suitable to her purpose. But she has made love to women for the last time. She has lied to Gede for the last time. Tell my horse to tell that woman I'm going to kill her today. She will not lie again. The woman pranced and galloped like a horse to a great mango tree, climbed it far up among the top branches, and dived off and broke her neck. End quote. Hurston includes this story without any proffered analysis. The reader does not know, then, whether this woman's suicide is caused by cruel gods or internalized social pressures. Without Hurston's commentary, the two become indistinguishable. For Hurston, the spirits themselves are, represent are representatives of human interpersonal cruelties, enforcers of heteropatriarchal domination rather than sources of refuge. Real gods, as Hurston says famously, and their eyes were watching God, require blood. In Tell My Horse, Hurston does with homophobia what she does with racism in their eyes were watching God. She makes discourses of oppression into, quote, a mood come alive through the bodies of the very people who are, most, who are most victimized by these discourses. In Dunham's version, the lesbian in question was one of her co-initiates, a young woman named Georgina, who, quote, bragged of male propensities and tendencies, and it was rumored that she, has pr that she had proven these aptitudes to several young girls of the neighborhood, end quote. Um, as punishment, Gede possesses her and makes her rub herself naked against a cactus and smear pepper into her own eyes and genitals. But Georgina lives to fight another day, chastened somewhat, but still a prized dance partner of Dunham's. The mutual fascination of Dunham and Hurston with this figure of the self-punishing lesbian shows their shared anxieties about the personal sacrifices that might be demanded of them if they truly want to belong within this Haitian belief system, a paradox which Dunham describes as the feeling of, quote, what sort of spectacle I would make of myself if by chance possessed, and what would be thought of me if I weren't, end quote. This tension between a good faith participation in local beliefs and a desire to remain above the fray anim animated some of the first Black American feminist inquiries into what it might mean to forge meaningful diasporic connections. In Haiti, Black women's relationship with voodoo is no, or Haitian women's relationship with voodoo is no less, is no less fraught, though for different reasons. The spirits are demanding, their desires sometimes contradictory to one's own, and the path is never easy. What is powerful about the religions of the African diaspora, especially voodoo, is not just their liberatory framework, but the way in which they incorporate decidedly unliberatory feelings. Jealousy, discomfort, betrayal, selfishness, all the bad affects created by centuries of enslavement and exploitation are not spirited away by these religions. They become part of them. As Colin Diane argues, noting, at, fir noting at, her at first her confusion at seeing whips and manacles as part of voodoo ceremony and iconography, voodoo was a belief system formed in the crucible of slavery and the struggle for freedom, and thus incorporates rather than neutralizes interpersonal violence. In an interview, Evelyn Jean-Gilles, a contemporary mambo working in the north of Haiti outside of Cap, of Cap Haitien, describes in an interview the troubling influence of spirits in her own life, how the spirit Ezili Freda prevented her from having children, how the spirits have even thrown her down the stairs and broken her bones in retaliation for her long absences from their altars. She did not even choose to serve the spirits at all, but rather was wrenched away from her life as a good Christian by the spirits and by Satan, who she, in keeping with diasporic tradition, does not view as an evil figure. Um, Vodou is a religion that illustrates the compromised agencies of diaspora without offering an easy way out, 
And in this way, it elegantly validates and holds space for Dunham's and Hurston's fears and desires. In the same way that Catherine Dunham and Zora Neale Hurston lived parallel struggles to bridge the enormity of their estrangement from African belief systems, so too do practitioners of voodoo depict their own estrangement from Africa with as much longing as Americans. As opposed to the practice of Yoruba-derived cosmologies in the diaspora, which make extensive use of Yoruba language and hearken, and hearken back to an African past, Vodou firmly inhabits life in the break of the Middle Passage and the enormity of the cultural loss, even as it stands as a monument to the resiliency of the faith of enslaved Africans. Vodou ceremonies typically begin with a prayer that expresses the sentiment of crossing the ocean and leaving Africa. As anthropologist Karen McCarthy Brown translates it in her definitive ethnography, Mama Lola of Vodou Priestess in Brooklyn, quote, the family is assembled, gathered in. We are Creoles who have Africa no longer, end quote. And yet, in Mama Lola's version of the prayer, the congregants later, later sing, quote, my friends, everything I am doing is heard in Africa, end quote. In Vodou, both possibilities exist along, alongside one another, the irreparable severing and the deep connection. If healing of, if healing between members of the diaspora is ever to be found, and I argue it is healing Dunham and Hurston were looking for, it is only fitting to look to a religion birthed as a technology of healing, creating new rituals, new theology, and new spirits to account for our haunted lives on new continents where we never wanted to be and yet are. This is what we speak of when we speak of magic. In Poetry is Not a Luxury, Audre Lorde speaks of poetry as an analytic, quote, by which we pursue our magic and make it realized. In this powerful formulation, magic is not inherent to us, but something we must chase, perhaps endlessly, because if we stop chasing, there would be no poetry. In the same way, solidarity between black women is not something that exists. It must be built. It must be pursued against the grain of language, region, capital, and time. Because Afro-diasporic solidarity, like freedom, is a constant struggle, and to represent it as anything other than that is to discount the work of our ancestors. If the complementing vision of Hurston and Dunham have taught us anything, it is that there can, be, there can be more than one little black girl in anthropology. We just have to make room for her. I'm just going to ask you a quick question, mm -hmm. but I'm, I'll look forward to your book, actually. Um, so... I'm going to try to combine two questions into one to simplify. Mm -hmm. I think um, I was intrigued by the notion of how both Dunham and Hurston treated issues of queer sexuality mm -hmm. in Voodoo. Mm -hmm. And then it made me think to an earlier question I had about Dunham, uh, because you talked about how Dunham has been forgotten in sort of uh, historiographic history of black women's history in, mm -hmm. in the United States in particular, whereas Hurston has been revived, mm -hmm. right, and has now a long life. Mm -hmm. um, and it made me think about the impact that she actually had in Haiti, mm -hmm. right? Because if you know, now Parc Martissant uh, encompasses a property that she used to own. Mm -hmm. She used to run a hotel yes, in Haiti. With very colonialist um, advertising. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, <laughs> but, but what's interesting about the hotel is that everybody who was anybody who came through Haiti mm -hmm. stayed there. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of elite Haitians, quote unquote progressive and also not progressive, went there. But it's now become part of this, uh, of um, Focal, right? Mm -hmm. Which is the new, uh, not very new, but a, a now longstanding um, sort of archive for community here, you know, in Haiti. Mm -hmm. So it just made me think about what happens when you shift the conversation to the Haitian side uh -huh. of these interactions, because I think Dunham has now a long history uh, or a revived history in Haiti, mm -hmm. uh, especially for the women who run Focal, mm -hmm. who will talk about the history of a hotel. Mm -hmm. um, but it also made me think about, you know, the fact that Dunham was trained by Herskovitz, mm -hmm. who did field work in Haiti, mm -hmm. uh, which is still uh, respected mm -hmm. in terms of its, of its uh, representation of voodoo. Um, and as I was re referencing yesterday about Darren, that her work also still stands up, mm -hmm. but there isn't this kind of homophobic, lesbophobic turn in Darren. Mm -hmm. um, and then when we look at people like Demang and um, the new book by Beaubrun, mm -hmm. you know, uh, where she interviews Mambos who recently passed away, uh, on the Haitian side, 
there is less of a sense of, of a homophobia yeah. and there's more of a queer sensibility in totally. voodoo. And so I wonder to what extent is this a, an American overlay mm -hmm. or, or sort of uh, to go back to the comments earlier from Kunkum, a kind of, um, you know, moral hysteria. Yeah, no, I absolutely think it's an American overlay because um, I think there has been a lot of scholarship around voodoo as like a particularly queer friendly religion, um, the, like particularly in documentary form by um, Laurence Magloire and um, and I forget the co-director on that in the um, in the documentary of Men and Gods, for example. Um, but, you know, like even looking at like Omisheki Natasha Tinsley's um, kind of queer theory work on the spirit Ezili, um, I think a lot of work has been done to show like both like by Haitians and by non-Haitians to show that um, that there is a strong queer sensibility within voodoo and that many practitioners are themselves queer. Um, so I was really troubled actually to read, but to read the same incident in both Dunham and Hurston. And I really feel like it's about their own variety of queerness. It's about the old, it's about the way that they practiced or did not practice queerness, like if they weren't queer. Um, but I think the um, 1920s and 1930s just had a different conception of queerness that was um, more based on practice and less identitarian, you know? So I feel, so the Harlem Renaissance, you kind of like hear about the Harlem Renaissance being as queer as it was black, but very few of those figures that we associate as being um, queer figures of the Harlem Renaissance were out and that includes Hurston and Dunham. And it's just because being out didn't really mean anything in that time period, you know, like, um, so, I mean, I think there was a real, there is like a kind of, there is a real um, shying away from like public queer visibility by writers, not out of shame, but out of, um, it was just a, dis it was just a different sensibility. So I think when Hurston and Dunham um, encountered kind of public forms of queerness, they, um, I don't know, they, it gave them, it gave them pause and it was not exactly how they wanted to conduct their own practice of queerness. So I think they really associated it with danger. And as we see, um, with like an out queer figure of the Harlem Renaissance, Gladys Bentley, who was like kind of forced back into the closet in the 1950s, their, um, their, their visions of that danger like was actually real for the American context. Um, but um, I think maybe less real for the Haitian context, but I absolutely think it was, <laughs> it was an overlay. Thank you for a beautiful paper. I wanted to ask the same question I asked uh, Miriam yesterday, whether you came across any evidence of interaction between uh, Zora Neale Hurston, Catherine Dunham and the Sylvain sisters, one of whom was an anthropologist uh -huh. who worked among market women and who also did a study of voodoo. Uh -huh. um, Suzanne, I think it was, Sylvain. Uh -huh. uh, did, did any of that appear in your research? Not really, no. Um, but I mean, I was actually thinking, I was actually thinking um, from Dr. Chancy's talk yesterday, just like about the kind of differences between Hurston's archives and Dunham's archives. Um, you know, like um, I've been to both archives, like Dunham's at um, Southern Illinois University and Hurston's at University of Florida. And like the extent to which um, Dunham's archive kind of visibilizes um, many of the things that I'm sure Hurston had to do too, but aren't documented from like, you know, in Dunham's archives, you'll find like scraps of paper where she was practicing Creole. You'll find like letters of introduction to the president of Haiti from Melville Herskovitz. You'll find, um, you'll find like meditations on like, what is gender anyway, like based on like 1936 Mardi Gras, you know, like, um, so I think I, I did not run across that in those archives part particularly, um, but I think Dunham's archives really do really do bespeak the extent to which um, she came with all these letters of recommendation from white anthropologists to introduce her to kind of local Haitian intellectuals and the local Haitian elite. Um, and I can't imagine that it was different for Hurston either. Um, so I'm sure even if there wasn't a specific letter of introduction, I'm sure they ran, they came across each other. Um, thanks very much for that. Um, this is a sort of, it's a, it's a very broad question and it's, it, you know, it's somewhat sort of methodological. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm, I'm interested in how you think about um, 
about anachronism in the archive, right? I mean, mm -hmm. you said um, in response, I think, to, to Miriam's question, well, you know, the, the idea of being out wasn't even an issue at that point. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so that would be one example, um, mm -hmm. uh, and and so I'm I'm just interested in in how how um, you think about uh, um, in your own work the way in which one one uh, uses and employs on one level the terminology of today, mm -hmm. um, uh, particularly when one's thinking about things like blind spots blind spots or mm -hmm. um, uh, that become evident in um, in contrasting the works as it were mm -hmm. um, and um, and how one uh, um, how one manages that in relation to the to the fabric that you're you're digging up in the archive in the uh -huh. archive. Mm -hmm. yes I think I think a lot about that and I do really try to um, I mean I feel like the only reason I kind of arrived at this conceptualization of Harlem Renaissance queerness as um, practice based rather than identitarian was through carefully considering um, both of their words around queerness like notably um, uh, you know, like in the kind of famous canonical queer reading of um, Their Eyes Were Watching God, you know, like um, as Dr. Chancy brought up, you know, the like, she's my friend, her tongue is in my mouth um, reading that also um, that also I think is described under the rubric of like Phoebe is described as Janie's kissing friend, which is like a whole different relationality that Hurston has thought of to describe this relationship. So no, it's not queer. Like she didn't say she was queer. She said they were kissing friends. And I feel like I want to respect that terminology that she uses for herself um, and center that. So when I'm working in archive and when I'm working um, with historical texts themselves, I try to base my conceptions um, off of um, the kind of like often more fluid conceptions that these writers had of themselves. I wanted to speak a little bit about solidarity or issues related to solidarity among uh, African diasporic women, and I know mm -hmm. we were talking a little bit earlier. And, um, you know, we're talking here about people uh, like anthropologists and others who are scholars who are more aware of the methodological issues and issues of privilege and power. But I also saw uh, uh, being at Winston Salem State University and HBCU. Uh, where uh, as part of the Africana studies uh, programs, th there was this idea that we need to connect with African and African diasporic mm -hmm. communities uh, in the Americas. And so we had programs in Ghana and Kenya and then Brazil and Cuba. And uh, seeing students, uh, you know, who are their first exposure to people of African, from Africa or African origin in those communities mm -hmm. was really um, very interesting because they went with this idealistic sense that yep. they're going back to the mother country, <laughs> even though Kenya is East Africa, <laughs> Ghana is a little different. Um, and then not knowing really a whole lot because of the dominant ideologies in the Americas about Brazil and Cuba especially. Um, and then I, you know, once I go there, it's a real shock to them that they are seen as Americans. Mm -hmm. And maybe even called white in a yeah, lot of countries. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But at the same time, they were very attractive to the men there. Like the women? The, the women were very mm -hmm. attracted to the men, yes. Because they, were, they would say, oh, I got a proposal, a marriage proposal, you know, even in those 10 days that they were there. And then some of them would say, oh, I, I have a new boyfriend now in Cuba, you know? And of course, as faculty and, uh, you know, everyone was like, oh, you know, trying to make them sensitize. Yeah, they're adults, you don't want to, they're exploring. But the whole structural system was just so contradictory, you know, because they're, you know, they're there study abroad and you're kind of observing. And it made me question the whole idea of you go and study, you know, it's, you don't do that. You know, that's a problematic concept in itself. But at the same time, you're then being experiencing these interactions and seeing your own identity being questioned, shaped, developed as part of that. But to what extent you kind of make them aware of these issues. So in some ways, it's learning. But I do remember one student actually did marry a Kenyan 
the after she graduated she went back there mm -hmm. and you know and then later was beginning so i'm just bringing this up that it's it's really a very complicated situation you know and i'm just not sure if you know what you were saying but it, it takes building relationships over a period of time i don't think it's something that exists organically in and of itself yeah yeah and i feel like maybe those like how Stella got her groove back, study abroad experiences are like maybe um, are part of the process and maybe a very early step <laughs> in the process. I mean, I don't think it's a necessary step of the process. Definitely the power dynamics involved with like dating a local person when you're there for 10 days and, or, <laughs> you know, like not necessarily something that I like avow or encourage as um, diasporic practice. But, <laughs> um, but I mean, I feel like it's like Kumkum Kum said earlier, it's about having the conversations um, and um, and I feel like, you know, something that I really love about this time period of the 1920s and 30s that I kind of started writing my dissertation about and I've now expanded is that um, this was one of the first times when black women were allowed to have those conversations in other countries, like on a large scale, not to say that there weren't black women traveling before, but, um, you know, like, I don't know, like everybody from like, I don't know, I do a lot of research on this woman, Florence Emery Jones, who um, was like, a working class single mom from Bridgeport, Connecticut, who like ended up owning a nightclub in Paris, for example, in the 1920s. Um, so, you know, like, I feel like, I, I think, despite the fact that I'm kind of like cataloging a lot of the flaws of these conversations, um, I think the conversations are the work like they are the work <laughs> that we have to do. And it's not, I definitely do not ever want to apply like a negative value judgment to however the conversations went in the 1930s, because, you know, it's like I tell my students when they're like, oh, cancel Dunham because she slept with <laughs> Jamel says, you because she slept with one of her informants. I'm like, do you think you could have done a better, like, do you think you could have done a better job? Do you have the answers that Dunham didn't have? Like, and if not, you know, like, maybe let's <laughs> keep talking about it. I need you to help me. This exactly what you said just now, that um, you don't want to pass a value judgment on something that was said in the 1930s, mm -hmm. you know, by Dunham or done by her. I don't know. Just say a little bit more about it. Say a little mm -hmm. bit more about why, because we all nodded. I nodded. And then I thought... Why am I yeah. nodding? So. <laughs> uh, I mean, I mean, I kind of do in the end. Like, I do end up like, you know, I do end up saying like, well, you know, like from our current lens, like, you know, like this looks this kind of way. Um, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> definitely not exempting myself from sloppiness. So I guess maybe the value judgment that I don't want to pass is um, the idea that there's a progress narrative, I guess, that like we are now past these issues. That's the value judgment that I don't want to pass. Like I don't necessarily, like I don't want to look at the things that Hurston in some cases said, like look at the derogatory things that Hurston in some time, in some ways said about Haitian people. Like I don't want to say like that was okay. I don't want to pass, the, you know, like that's not, I don't want to not pass the value judgment about that, but I think it really is more about dismantling the progress narrative. Um, and kind of like looking at the ways in which we are also stuck in the way that Hurston and Dunham were. Like they didn't, they didn't produce like these problematic, they didn't produce problematic discourses when they did like because they wanted to, they, you know, like it was like a kind of constraining set of circumstances that I want to acknowledge um, that we are still in in a lot of ways. I, I feel like I was going to say something and then you answered it so well. I think what I really loved about your talk is that you set up a relationship that could be seen solely as an individual relationship or a difficult relationship between Hurston and Dunham. And, and by looking at structural and systemic relations that produce them into conflict, it allows us to carry hold it at, in another way. So I just I wanted to say thank you for that because I think it... it uh, I, my question is also around potential for solidarity, and I mm -hmm. and I and I think that 
what I'm hearing you say is that there is no potential unless we are willing to carry the difficult stuff and the ways that, that these, these are not indiv simply individually hurt, felt, relational. Mm -hmm. They are also embedded in these larger forces that, that produce them. So thank you. Yeah. No, thank you for encapsulating <laughs> that. Your, Lisa yeah. handed me the microphone, so I guess I'll say something. Um, <laughs> yeah. <Thanks. laughs> Which, and they're minor, I mean, again, minor observations. One is that what I love is that they are embedded in these broader structural things, but one of the things that I like about thinking through these naughty things through people mm -hmm. and choosing complex people mm -hmm. is that there's some part of me that's like, and Zora's just difficult, right? <laughs> I mean. Right? And, that's a, and so to imagine that's kind of like we and this are our like political project and how we would get to solidarity, I'm fairly certain that my way of getting there would not be Zora Neale Hurston's way, mm -hmm. right? Um, and that's really helpful, too, to be mm -hmm. able to balance again, the particular and what is generalizable. Yeah. Um, and then as a minor, like super nerdy historian point, when you were talking about your student being like, cancel Dunham, <laughs> I had this vision of Roger Williams, who was the, the Puritan who left Massachusetts to go to Rhode Island. I can't remember if he was sent out or he, but, but he basically was one of these people whose like Puritan purity mm -hmm. was so intense that he would only take communion with people who met his standards who were as holy or as faithful oh. and like maybe this is not actually what happened but I have this vague memory from John Morton Bloom's biography of Roger Williams that by the end of his life he was only taking <laughs> communion with himself I bet yeah <laughs> yeah and I think that that is the I mean we all want to be a little more humble than Roger Williams when we try to build our utopian world. Yeah, I love that. Thank you for that anecdote. Like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna recycle my that to my students of next time. Of yeah, no, I love that. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>